Good morning, everybody. So uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, in front of this audience and to discuss the uh, role and the interpretation of the intravascular pressures. And of course, when we will have to talk on these measurements, we'll have to talk on different things. And um, we have globally three big uh, pressures we may discuss. The pulmonary artery pressure, of course. The pulmonary artery occluded pressure, uh, which is also very important. And finally, the right atrial pressure or central venous pressure. The, the issue is, uh, first, how to measure it. And of course, we have several tools to measure it. And we have the limitations that will be specific to the tool and the limitations that will be specific to the measurements. And of course, I will first discuss a little bit the tools, and then we will mostly discuss the measurement itself. So we have, of course, the invasive measurements with the pulmonary artery catheter, which is on board for a long time, but also uh, with the central venous one. And of the other aspect is that we can also have some non-invasive measurement of these pressures with echocardiography. And we will take a little bit to discuss this also, of course. With the invasive measurements with the pulmonary artery catheter mostly, we have, but also with central line, we have some problems, of course, because we measure pressure in a vessel. But this vessel is surrounding by the thorax, the thorax itself being surrounding by the abdomen. And so we may have sometimes a problem because we do not really measure the true intra vascular transmural pressure, but we measure a pressure that may be affected by the intrathoracic pressure, the PEEP especially, but also the intra-abdominal pressure. And finally, the other aspect is that we sometimes face a problem of the quality of measurements, because the variable we try to measure is not as stable, as well defined as we may expect. And indeed, when we have this kind of traces, when with some respiratory fluctuations, it's quite easy to remember, but not always well applied at bedside, that we always have to take it at end expiration. And of course, in mechanical ventilation, it will be at that place, and in spontaneous bracing, it will be here. But if we do not pay attention to this, we may make an error up to 10 or 15 millimeters of mercury. So the error in the measurement induced by these kind of things may be quite huge, and we have to pay attention to it. When we are a physician, well, uh, at the bedside, it may be easy. But when we trust on numbers written on a board, then sometimes we may be, uh, in, there may be some errors there. The second aspect, of course, is the transmitted pressure, and especially due to the PEEP itself. And uh, even when we are trying to have the um, end expiratory pressure with uh, pressure, we are still facing some residual pressure in thorax, which may affect it. And so there, there have been some ways uh, developed to try to measure it. The first one, of course, was to disconnect the ventilator and to rapidly look at the nadir, um, so the lowest uh, papo just after uh, the slow increase back because of the increase in venous return. Of course, this is a true one, but it is not always very good to do, just because, indeed, you just disconnect the ventilator, and so you lose all the recruitment to the lungs and other problems like this. So while keeping the patient connected to the ventilator, it is feasible just to compute it. It is not very difficult. Of course, it takes you a little bit of time, because you have to compute the variability in the primary artery occluded pressure. You have to measure the uh, plateau pressure. You have to measure the uh, end expiratory pressure. But then it's just computation. It's easy, indeed, just to compute the true um, by um, multiplying these by PEEP and uh, withdrawing this value from the actual primary occluded pressure you measure. So this is a way to counteract this problem of uh, transmission of pressure to the system that can be applied, but it has not been widely used, uh, at least in publications. We can also use the echographic measurements of intravascular pressure. The advantage, of course, is that we will not have to face this problem of transmitted pressure. The pulmonary pressure is reliable and easy to measure, and especially the pulmonary artery pressure is a systolic part component of the pulmonary artery pressure. The other pressure can also be measured, but we will see that these are a little bit more difficult to measure. 
Of course, we can try to have the marginal inflow that will get us some, in, some idea of the pulmonary artery occluded pressure. Indeed, if we look at the traces here of the uh, left ventricular pressure here, and you also look at the left arterial pressure, you understand well the determinants of both the E wave of the marginal flow and the A wave. And of course, due to these, when you look at the changes in the left arterial pressure and the, the um, left ventricular pressure, you can see that when the uh, left atrial pressure increases, there is a change in the morphology of the mitral flow. So it is possible to quantificate this. The problem is that each patient is not exactly the same, and age, ventricular compliance may affect both the um, E and A wave, so that these numbers cannot be applied easily. So it is feasible to try to go compensate this using some other factors like the uh, tissue Doppler or the uh, uh, propagation of the um, mitral flow to try to minimize the impact of diastolic dysfunction. And using this, you can, all, can see that the pattern, without being an expert, you can see that the pattern here of the mitral flow is different from the pattern from mitral flow here. And so you can get some different numbers and a lot of significant differences between low PAOP and high PAOP. The, the only problem is that most of these measurements are mostly useful when they are used semi-quantitative. You say it is above this value or below this value. But really have a, a very sharp and precise value is probably not very good with the echo just because the confidence interval are wide. And you can just see it here on this on this graph, which is one of the, the best ones in the literature, showing that indeed, if you look at the global correlation, there is a good correlation. But if you look at the agreement, the agreement is quite close. It is an agreement of 5 to 6 millimeters of mercury, which means that when you have measuring a POP of 15, it can be 10 or 12 or of 20 not really the same. And so this is probably the limitation there. And so it is very useful when you use it semi-quantitatively, but not really when you need to have a very precise measurement. So the advantage of both is that indeed with the PA catheter, we have a continuous one and a relatively accurate one. The disadvantage it is invasive, of course, and we have some technical limitation we have to take into account and we, we have to know it. For the echography, it is of course totally non-invasive. It's also measuring true transmural one. But the problem, it is a discontinuous method and also it is semi-quantitative for many of the measurements. So the problem now, what we do with these measurements? And so what are the information we are given when we measure things? So of course we can try to have some diagnosis and I will not go into details here because it's not really the, uh, the goal of this uh, monitoring session. We also have some uh, preload evaluation and this will be uh, very interesting because we will have some idea of the volume and also we can guide through challenge and also we can have some idea of the cardiac function. I will not go into details of the cardiac function uh, because of time. We can evaluate the right ventricle afterload, especially with pulmonary artery, or, uh, pulmonary artery pressure and we can also try to evaluate the pulmonary capillary pressure, but uh, this may perhaps be a little bit more difficult. So mostly CVP or pulmonary artery occluded pressure. Why do we use this? Well, to indicate the administration of fluids, yes, maybe, to monitor the effects of fluid, probably more, and to evaluate whether fluids are tolerated, and this is probably much more relevant. To indicate the administration of fluids, we will see a lot of these slides this morning and probably in, in the next days also that indeed we have some relation here which is totally physiological between stroke volume and these pressures. The problem is that when you try to have a specific uh, indication of the response to fluid, you, we have some clouds there and indeed this is true for CVP, for pulmonary artery occluded pressure, but also for volumes which are not very well predicting response to fluid also and whatever the method you measure it. And it is quite easy to understand because indeed you do not have one single styling relationship for everybody. We have a lot of these one and so indeed it is quite difficult when we measure one CVP or one PAOP or even whatever volume to indeed guess what would be the response to the patient. It is only when we are in the extreme conditions, very low or very high, that we have a high probability of a, of a specific response. But most of our patients will be in this middle area where it will be quite difficult indeed to predict something. And indeed it has been shown repeatedly that we do not have a good predictive value here. But things are not always, not always so dark. Indeed, if we look carefully look at the literature, 
we may discover that in some conditions, especially when these very nice dynamic in indices are not well performing, then indeed the other one still get some values. Here you can see that uh, we looked at the uh, uh, pulmonary artery occluded pressure, even correcting it for the uh, formula I, I just uh, reported to you a, f a couple of minutes ago, and these were among the best predictors of fluid response, better than other indices, but this was in patients with respiratory movements. So in these conditions, you still may have uh, some value. It is not ideal, but at least it is better than chance. And indeed also, as shown yesterday by Jean-Louis already, the uh, value uh, when it is very low is highly indicative of some response. When it is very high, the limit is there. And it's true also for the uh, POP. The problem indeed is that it is, even when you face some response to fluid, it's probably not a major problem of the patient. Indeed, when you have this kind of very high POP or right arterial pressure, your patient may st still may have some response to fluid but probably the key factor of this patient was not hypovolemia. So you always have to make some differences between the diagnosis, the, the key problem of your patient, and the way you may treat your patient because indeed response to fluid is observed even when hypovolemia is not the, key, the, the leading problem. And the best example is to take all of us here. We are all fluid responsive but we are not hypovolemic. So we have to make some distinction between the diagnosis itself and some key to improve the hemodynamics. And indeed, the response to fluid may still be observed even when your patient is not hypovolemic, even when pulmonary artery pressure or arterial pressure are elevated. The so second aspect, and probably much more important, is that we also could monitor the effects of fluid. Of course, we have to remember that whatever the method we use to re to predict the response to fluid, we may have some error in this prediction. It is not 100% reliable. So it is important at the bedside to evaluate whether indeed your patient respond to fluid or not. And so you have to do something. And of course, you have to measure cardiac output. Whatever the technique you use, it is good. So we don't tell, we don't tell about pressures here. No. But at some time, we have to look at it. Because indeed, the absence of response to fluid when we have a absence in response to fluid, we are in trouble because we do not know why it doesn't answer to fluid. Is it due because your patient was not responsive, even though you predicted by some things that he should respond to fluid? Or is it an insufficient load because indeed your patient had some capillary leak or is still bleeding and then you need to give more fluid to your patient? Well, you can only address this question when you indeed evaluate the response in preload because if preload is affected, then you know that it is indeed a non-responsive. Oh, so we have to look carefully at the fluid challenge. Of course, we, do some, we infuse some amount of fluids. We make some measurements before and after. But we have also, of course, to put some safety rules. And then we begin to see the pressures. We also have to evaluate the response. And of course, if the positive test will only be defined by the increasing cardiac output, easy. You don't have to measure anything more. But a negative test can be the absence of increasing cardiac output despite an increase in the preload assessed here by the pressures. And of course, you have an undefinite answer when you have no change in cardiac output, but also no change in preload. And it is very important to remember that the pressure measurements can better evaluate the response to fluid challenge than volume measurements. And I will show you this in this single cartoon. If you look at the response between cardiac output and pressure, it is curvilinear with the pressure, but it is linear um, with the uh, volume. And so you have this kind of aspect when you begin your free change or very low with hypovolemia. You increase, uh, initially you have a large increase in volume, a, a large increase in cardiac output, but a small change in pressure. Later on, you have a more and more um, decrease in the change in volume and a higher change in pressure because of the compliance curve of the ventricle. And at the end, you end up with almost no change in volume, no change in cardiac output, but huge changes in pressure. So changes in pressure help you to understand that when you have no change in cardiac output, no change in volume, then you are indeed on the very dangerous part of the system because you mark the increase in pressure and you do not have any beneficial effect on any other aspect of the hemodynamics. 
So it is also very important to understand that uh, pressures are very good to evaluate whether fruits are well tolerated. And indeed, CVP still has some value because indeed it is a limitation of venous return. And also it is one of the key factors uh, determining the peripheral edema. When, when you have a CVP of 20, even though cardiac output may increase, the edema, the peripheral edema, will also increase quite a lot. So when you balance between the indication of fluids and the risk of fluid, having the idea of the pressure is very important to know where you are. And the same is true, of course, with the pulmonary artery occluded pressure for the lungs. So when we talk on pre pressure, volumes, or nothing, we have to, me to realize that uh, whatever we measure, even when we, when we measure nothing, pressure and volumes are linked in your body or in the body of your patient. And indeed, we have this curve with when we begin, we are very low pressure. And when we end up, we may end up with a very high pressure. And this is always the case. So we have to remember that when we measure volumes, when we don't measure anything, we just give fluids, we will have some increase in pressure if we go up to this part when indeed we are a little bit uh, in the flat part of the starting relationship. And this is really the area when we will be at risk. The problem is, that is also that we have some patients with a decreased compliance. And compared to this normal relationship when we all will say, oh, I will never go to this flat part of this starting curve, Indeed, when you have the patient with this kind of a relationship, you may sometimes have patients with indeed elevated pressure and a low volume and a low cardiac output and a huge response to fluid predicted by any measurement you may, may, you may have. But it is in these conditions when indeed the pulmonary artery occluded pressure is less predictive because indeed it is 20 or something like this that the response to fluid may be absurd, but also that the danger of fluids also exists and that your patient may be really at risk when he will receive some fluids. And indeed, if you compare this curve to that curve, it is indeed in these patients that you probably will need to have a higher primary artery occluded pressure and then indeed these patients may be at risk of developing edema. But of course, if you do not measure pressure, you will never know that your patient is here and not here. So this is why, in my mind, measuring pressure are still very important in some of these patients. So the implication is indeed that an increase in pressure or volume indicates an increase in preload. A lack of change in left ventricular volume may mask an increase in preload. And patients with diastolic dysfunction have a narrow therapeutic window between free responsiveness and risk of pulmonary edema. And we have to take this in mind, whatever we measure, because indeed pressure and volumes are affected by food challenge in our patients even when we do not measure it. The last aspect of the uh, pressure is that indeed hypervolemia cannot be differentiated from normal volemia with many of the tools we have at the bedside. Indeed, if we look at the starting curve, when we begin we have a low pressure, uh, high stroke volume variation and low volumes. But when we increase it, the uh, stroke volume variation will be minimized and will be almost never affected here. So having no fluid responsiveness at that stage does not make any difference between normal volemia, which is good for your patient, and hypervolemia, which is not good for your patient. Measuring volumes may be of some help, but at some time, just because of the uh, compliance curve, you will not make any difference between, indeed, severe hypervolemia and some hypervolemia. And especially in patients with diastolic dysfunction, you will fail to see just because the pressure will rise much more rapidly than the volume will increase. <coughs> Pulmonary artery occluded in risk of edema. Indeed, it has been uh, long debated and is on the way for a long time. And we do not have a very good number because we have these kind of numbers, but unfortunately it is affected when we have increased cap uh, permeability and indeed, so it is quite difficult to know exactly where we should stop, but it is quite important in each of the patients to determine what you think would be the uh, most appropriate or the most tolerable one. And indeed, uh, you can play with this kind of aspect. And I will end up um, here showing that, indeed, how can we use the intravascular measurements at the bedside? Well, first, of course, it is helping diagnosis respond to therapy. The role in fluid monitoring, mostly for detecting hypervolemia or the risk of pulmonary edema. 
also in free challenge, but mostly for detection of changes in preload and evaluation of safety, much more than for the prediction of the response to free itself, which should be, in my mind, uh, be driven by other means. And we have not to talk on the pulmonary capillary pressure, but this is, in my mind, mostly for um, research purpose. <laughs>